Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet, which is locked in a pandemic, which is very smoky in many parts right now. Places which is very sod sodden along the Gulf Coast. Uh, there's been incredible um, climate impacts around Bangladesh uh, that we've had on this broadcast recently. Um, over and over again, we're faced with uh, rapid change with a lot of certainty about issues around us, uh, but a lot of murk as well. And these Friday sessions on my Sustain What Earth Institute webcast are devoted to cutting through the hashtags and the headlines with uh, journalists and with experts to try to see if we can navigate toward some actual solutions, things that matter on the ground. I'm Andy Revkin, again, I've been offline here for a couple of weeks, um, so I apologize for the silence on Sustain What. This is like episode number 85 since March. And you're looking at lightning if you're watching this uh, online and my, my guests here as well. You'll, you'll meet them all in a second. In a way, a lot of what we're paying attention to in California right now started with an astound, astounding lightning display and storm and uh, resulting combustion focused uh, significantly in the Santa Cruz County area. And we'll hear from uh, Dustin Mulvaney, who's an environmental studies professor at UC San, San Jose, uh, San Jose State, who took, did you take these images? Is this part of your, this is on your Twitter feed, uh, Dustin. You can un unmute, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I um, pretty much took a lot of those photos. Uh, there was an amazing roll cloud that I did not take. That is, uh, I think, appropriately labeled who took it. But yeah, that video I took, I was watching this storm roll up. Our local meteorologist, who I um, always am checking on Twitter because he, he knows everything that's happening. And uh, he was just noting that there's lightning moving up and went outside. You know, we have I have a 10 month old. so. My hours are, you know, two parents parenting in a pandemic full time, kind of chaos. So I stepped outside and I saw flashes. And I've seen this before. I lived here for 20 years. I've seen lightning storms. I actually, when I lived in Ben Lomond, I remember seeing a cloud that just like extended into the distance and sat there for hours and dropped lightning, not over me, but like way off in the same area that, that burned. So I've seen this before and, and um, it's just an amazing sight. So I just didn't expect the fire. Right, I was going to say, so at that point, it was just like, oh, my God, look at the sky. It, and, I, so the other, can I just add one more thing? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I keep a fog diary, which is insane. When does the fog break in Santa Cruz? So I have, like, <laughs> years and years of this information. It was the foggiest summer I remember, and it's the foggiest one that I have documented well because um, of the pandemic. I'm here every day. Usually I'm off in the mountains, and I have big chunks missing for summer conferences, blah, blah, blah. But since I'm home, I have a really good and thorough um, so I, I, uh, data set. And it was just so foggy. I wasn't expecting this stuff to burn. And I, I mean, I know up in the, the tops, the marine layer, which is, I think, where it burst um, right. above that area. If you start looking at some of the, the research that's going out there um, from the, the fire weather lab. And I don't really understand that research, but just reading the synopsis of it, that kind of drying that happens in the upper part of the mountains kind of accelerated what smoldered for a while. I mean, that is the telltale sign here. The lightning struck and it didn't explode right away. And that's typically, so my usual beat for fires, there is a connection with fires. I am an expert witness before the Public Utilities Commission. I've done work for Earth Justice and Sierra Club, usually around net metering. But I've also followed the wildfire stuff because that's where the proceedings happen with right. managing wires. So I usually like to say that I'm on the wires that make fires beat, but not this one. Because all right, the fires right. in this county have been either generators that exploded or campfires that were left and then this one this lightning the fact that it smoldered really tells you something about a, a, a dynamic that's different than most fires i think in california inland and, and and actually before we move on to uh broaden the conversation could you describe your background is mostly in like solar energy and policy related to the energy i'm climate. i am the ultimate environmental studies mutt i have a, a, <laughs> a batch a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering with a minor in applied physics. Uh, and I have a mat and I worked in the chemical industry for several years in manufacturing, hmm. which became useful later on. I did a master's degree with um, Eric Katz at the New Jersey Institute of Technology was my advisor. David Rothenberg was on my committee. I know you know him. Andy. Well. Um, and that was an environmental philosophy. 
more or less, environmental ethics. So I kind of smashed my engineering brain against an ethics framework. And then my uh, PhD is in environmental studies, which is kind of the ultimate uh, mix of, of things. Uh, my areas of emphasis are political ecology, science and technology studies. And I, in environmental studies, we had to train in a discipline and I had insect ecology as my area because I was studying something that was more closely related to that, not the solar industry at the time. So there's my background. So and a postdoc at Berkeley in between that was also helpful. But what's really cool about this particular group of people is the you all have these very cool vantage points on what's going on right now. Uh, Tom Swetnam from the University of Arizona, your work for decades in charting the fire history of this region is uh, exemplary. And you know you you did a, an incredible Twitter string, which is the modern form of putting your expertise out into the into the world um, that caught my attention. And of course, we've I've had you on in my my daughter Earth blog before. Um, so when you saw those lightning fires, lightning smacks fires, and of course, there, I mean, there's a broader, broader landscape of fire problems in California. We'll, but let's maybe stay with the this particular moment, this this uh, big bend and the redwoods and San, 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 Santa Cruz area. What what came to mind right away for you was this did it feel fundamentally new or like back to the back to what you knew so well? And you're you're muted as well right now. Yeah, it was it's I've been nervous, uh, of course, the last 10, 20, 30 years with rising temperatures and, you know, what's been going on in California almost every year and almost year round in California, particularly about the redwoods, um, both the coast redwoods and the giant sequoias that the two species, you know, that I've I've studied um, in some detail. Um, they're sort of the ultimate of tree ring species, you know, that they're the among the oldest trees in the world and largest uh, trees in the world, tallest. And they, they truly are magnificent. And it's been a great pleasure working in those and an honor to work in those um, in those groves. But I'm worried about them because just uh, naturally they're isolated and they're uh, distributed in very small groves across the state and they're at risk. Um, so I've been waiting for and worried about the, the time when we might see some really high intensity fires come through some of these groves and do some damage. And I have to say, I've not so, I have not been so worried about the coast redwoods because mm -hmm. naturally, ecologically, they seem to be adapted to high severity fires. Now, yeah, you see my, on the Twitter feed there, I put um, an image of, the, of a fire scar. This is from a paper by Mark Finney uh, working on tree rings, looking at the base of these trees. You can see these injuries from past fire events. They appear as a, as a, a scar, a place where the, the tissue was killed. And what we've found in dozens of studies now in Coast Redwood is that <laughs> fires burn typically less than 20 year intervals frequent, frequent fires in the coast redwoods, but they were burning a low intensity and low severity, partly because they were burning so frequently. Um, and the thing about the coast redwoods, it's that's a real strong clue that this is actually a human um, controlled fire regime is that there's relatively little lightning. I mean, this last fire bust with all the lightning is kind of the exception. I mean, it, it's rare to get uh, this much lightning in the coastal areas. But uh, with the fire frequencies that we see in the fire scar tree ring record in Coast Redwood, the only thing that can explain that high frequency of fire is that people were setting fires. And this, this stands to reason it's known actually, the indigenous people, the native um, tribes of California um, know very well from their oral histories that they use fire, they use fire to manage these forests. So there was very frequent fire being put in these forests, which maintained them open and promoted um, the plant and animal species that uh, the people, the native people used and needed and depended upon. But at the same time, there's a tree ring record that shows high severity fire rarely occurring in these groves. And that shows up as a very strong release where the, the after a fire event, after a fire scar, very rarely, these trees show a surge in growth. And what's happening there is probably as many of the understory trees are being killed by a high severity fire, not one of the low intensity frequent fires, but like at 
many hundred year intervals, you get these really hot fires that would kill enough trees that would cause a release in the overstory trees. So high severity fires are not uh, outside of the realm of adaption, adaptation for, for coast redwoods. Now the giant sequoias is a different story. They, um, they basically are not adapted to, the, to re recovering from these fires because they cannot re-sprout from their bowls like the coast redwood. So the coast redwood, after you get a big high severity fire, will put on new branches and new leaves. Even really highly, heavily scorched tree will recover. Um, but the giant sequoias, they don't seem to have that ability to re-sprout. So frequent fires maintained open forests in both the sequoias and in the coast redwoods. Um, but now we've had 150 years of putting fires out. Right. So now we're getting higher severity fires. So in a long, in a long, long and short of it is I think the coast redwoods are probably going to be fine with high severity fire events in coming years. The giant sequoias I'm much more concerned about. And in fact, there have been some high severity fires in recent years. They've been killing a number of the large sequoia trees in some of the groves. So we're, we may be on the edge. Uh, and the clue of a big change will be if we lose one of these groves. So there's about 70 giant sequoia groves in the Sierra Nevada at about middle at mid elevations. And some of them are like six trees or a dozen trees. Yeah. And if in coming decades we lose one of those groves, that'll be a, uh, the proverbial canary in the, in the, in the coal mine. So I, I can't wait to get to Bettina as the journalist in terms of, um, I know you did a really good story of, on lightning sparked fire history in recent decades. And, and again, to Kelly, we'll get to the solutions question of how do we live with fire, knowing that it's not going away magically, even if Greta Thunberg and Joe Biden and we all ran the world tomorrow. Um, but I wanted to start with Jennifer Balch as well. Your work on this sort of the geography of fire and the things that influence it has been so interesting to me. I think you were in Connecticut when I first saw your work or you ended up you migrated. Now you're at the University of Colorado with a really cool lab. Uh, so. Maybe give us a thumbnail sketch of what you're doing in this context. I, on Twitter, I posted some links to some of your work. But um, what's your reaction and what you're seeing? Yeah, I wanted to um, reflect on some of the things that have been said. And I also kind of posted in Twitter an image of the Western US and the historical lightning and human ignition um, mm -hmm. started fires. And you can kind of see um, that there's a relatively rare, um, at least in the historical context, this lightning siege that we've seen in, in California. And we might want to think back to 2017, which was another big fire year too. And most of those wildfires were started by people. In fact, we did an analysis at the time, looking at the tubs, the Atlas, the Thomas fire. And we actually looked at the lightning ignitions from the National Lightning Detection Network just to see if we could exclude that as a possibility. And in fact, 48 out of the fires that were burning at the time, midsummer in 2017, were not at all near any cloud to ground lightning strike. And so California actually sees about 85% or more, depending on the data set that you use, 85% of the fires in California are actually started by people. Um, and part of the reason why is because of this distribution. Um, the, ma the mountains are magnets for lightning. And so west of the Sierras, there's actually a huge door of opportunity for people to be starting wildfires. So that's a couple kind of initial thoughts on this um, and what we're seeing this particular year. I'll also say to the climate piece that um, this particular year has been striking in terms of the the how hot and dry it is over sustained periods of time. So we were just looking at some climate data from a good friend and colleague, John Abatsaglu, and essentially what we're seeing in Fresno is VPD values um, off the charts. And what that means is VPD is a combination of temperature and relative humidity, and it essentially indicates how hot and dry it is and how fast moisture can get sucked out of fuels. 
And so we're seeing really sustained dry conditions and hot conditions. And we know across the West that we've seen a doubling of forest fires since the 1980s as a function of drier fuels. Um, we know in California in particular that we're seeing a five-fold increase in fires since the 1970s. And we have good evidence now. The fire science community has really strong linkages between anthropogenic climate change and the increase in wildfires. And I don't expect these trends to change anytime soon. We are committed to a certain degree of climate change and wildfire is really responsive to warming. It takes just a little bit of warming to see a lot more burning. We're, we're nowhere near the top of that curve right now. So those right. are a few thoughts. So they, they lead, that leads pretty powerfully to um, the work of Headwaters Economics and Kelly. Um, but I want to intervene here and let my journalist colleague uh, start with some thoughts and reactions too. Bettina, you won a Pulitzer Prize, I think it was in 2009. Ah, uh, yes. I won a Pulitzer Prize with a colleague for a series uh, that we did on wildfire, um, wildfire in 2008. Back. Right. Um, so uh, a couple of uh, observations from what I've been hearing. Um, so last weekend, I actually um, did a story about uh, how there is um, a history of big fires uh, in California that have been caused by lightning. Um, and if you look at the, the data, the most destructive fires in terms of loss of life and loss of property are invariably caused by wind-driven uh, fires in Southern California. It's the Santa Ana's and the Bay Area. Uh, uh, it, you know, they have another name um, in Santa Barbara. It's the Sundowners. Um, mm -hmm. in the Bay Area is the Diablos. <clears throat> um, but if you look at the um, recorded history of really big fires, the largest fires, many of them, you know, certainly not all, but many of them were caused by lightning. Um, so, uh, and I, when I was just doing a little bit of research, I came across this um, uh, Forest Service uh, video that was about uh, the 1987 uh, fire siege when, um, mm -hmm. 750,000 acres burned in Northern California, you know, from a series, you know, thousands of lightning strikes. Um, uh, it, I have rarely seen something that made me feel so old because <laughs> it was filmed in 1987, the first year that I came to the Los Angeles Times. Uh, and if you, uh, you know, you just look at the technology and uh, you, you kind of <laughs> think that you're, you're listening to a 1950s uh, broadcast. <laughs> I mean, it talked about, you know, the pyrocumulus fire clouds as being, you know, like nuclear blasts and, a, you know, a holocaust and the fires from hell. Um, but at any rate, um, and we do, you know, there is a history of big fires in California caused by lightning. And if you, you know, if you look at the, you know, uh, pre-settlement, you know, fire regimes, um, um, I mean, there's been research trying to figure out, um, you know, how much acreage burned in California pre-settlement before 1800. Uh, and those fires would have been a function of both lightning and Native American uh, burning. Um, Scott Stevens and some other UC Berkeley people came out in um, 2007 with a study that estimated that every year about four and a half million acres of California burned and that it was common for the, um, you know, the the, you know, the skies of California to be smoky during the summer and the fall. So as we all know, fire is a part of, you know, um, the natural um, part of nature in California. And we have a highly flammable uh, landscape. Now that's been, that fire regime has been distorted by a number of things. Um, and climate change is one of them, but not all of them. And I, I always like to point out that there are a number of other factors going on that we need to pay attention to. Even if there was no global warming, we would still be having um, um, a fire problem in California and much of the West because of fire suppression, because of logging that took out the big old fire resistant trees and in many cases in the national forest, particularly in the 1970s, established plantations, which created a lot of young, even aged growth, which was, you know, never properly thinned. 
um, uh, invasive species, um, which are changing the fire regime um, uh, in many places, you know, replacing native shrubs um, with invasive grasses that burn much more easily and burn every year. Uh, and of course, the relentless push of, of people into the wildland urban interface, uh, and as Jennifer pointed out, um, the majority of fires are human related, whether it is, you know, accidentally, sometimes rather hilariously accidentally. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's not so much arson, but, you know, sparks from equipment uh, or, I mean, the biggest you know, fire in modern history um, was a couple of years ago up in Mendocino County. It was called the Mendocino Complex. It was caused when a rancher um, <clears throat> hammered a plug uh, into a wasp nest um, during a very hot, you know, incredibly hot um, afternoon um, and a spark flew into some dry grass. That's how the biggest recorded fire in California started by a rancher plugging a wasp nest um, Amazing. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there are a number of factors, you know, that, that are going on here. And indeed, climate change is one of them and, you know, um, is, is accentuating these things. But it is not the only thing. And if we're going to deal with this, these other things need to be dealt with, too. For sure. And that's going to swing me to um, Kelly's work, which I, I think I first wrote about Headwaters Economics in the context of fire when Obama was considering his second term options uh, in, the, in the face of a recession. And I was looking for cost effective things you could do to limit environmental risk uh, in the face of uh, having very limited resources. Um, and one of the things was to build smarter in zones of implicit hazards. So we're not constantly telling FEMA and the, and the fire service, the forest service, you know, fired, fired folks to come in with very costly interventions. And now you've done a recent study that I'll show in the Twitter thread in a minute uh, on just how, how simple it is and very and cheap to um, build with fire in mind. So not, you're not so that we are not constantly kind of facing this kind of calamity, at least on that scale. We all have, we have, you're going to be facing the smoke issues and all kinds of issues going forward, but can we at least build better and, and or retrofit? So Kelly, uh, and I'm going to show something in a second that will help to illustrate this point. Um, hold on right here. This was one of the most striking visuals that came out of the um, terrible, awful, tragic, consequences in Paradise, California. Was that two years ago? It feels like forever. Um, aerial imagery showed that in a in very real way, this was, as I think Stephen Pine told me, this was a, an urban fire in a forest, not really a forest fire. You could see the vulnerability that must have been built there to see so much loss uh, from windborne uh, embers. But let's get back to the very specific question of your study that you did. And how it might relate to building a California going forward that uh, isn't scrambling so much to um, recover from such terrible losses that we've seen lately. Yeah, thanks, Andy, and pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, yeah, so so Headwaters Economics, we're an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit research group, and we work to improve community development and land management decisions. So we kind of work at that intersection of the environment and the economy, and we help communities with a range of issues, kind of the, the toughest issues communities face today, and wildfire is, is one among those. So um, we have been working on wildfire for a while and, and really were noticing these converging trends that all of you have been describing, a warming climate, a century or more of fire suppression and fire exclusion um, in fire adapted landscapes. So we've got a, a buildup of fuel and a change in the fuel structure in many ecosystems, more people igniting fires, and more people building in harm's way. So in fact, the, this wildland urban interface, the area where homes and communities intermingle and, and mix with flammable vegetation is the fastest growing land use type in the country. So we're converting more of that type to housing than, than any other land use type. And um, we recognize that, that there are strategies and tools we can deploy now to help communities become better fire adapted. We're living in these fire adapted ecosystems and the communities we're building are not necessarily um, fire adapted. So 
one strategy that's that's really effective is to build homes, specifically structures, to to withstand or be resistant to wildfire. So we work with communities across the country. We've worked with over 70 communities through our program called Community Planning Assistance for Wildfire that we run with some partners, including the Forest Service. And we go into communities and help them strengthen their codes, their land use plans, their ordinances to be um, more resilient to wildfire. So they're, they're taking wildfire into consideration in the way they're designing subdivisions, building their roads, thinking about landscape regulations, and building codes. So um, some places have enacted building codes for wildfire resistance, and California is actually the only state in the, in the country that has a statewide level building code for areas that have um, high wildfire hazard. But in other places around the country, we hear communities are really interested in, in these kinds of regulations, but they're concerned about the cost. Um, how much more would it cost homeowners or builders to construct a home to these standards? So we set out to find out, and that's what the study is that Andy's showing here. Um, and we essentially took a home that had been constructed in a wildland urban interface environment in Montana, partnered with a community here in Montana, and kind of rebuilt that house in, the, in a model using wildfire resistant materials and designs. So for example, we swapped out vinyl gutters for metal gutters. We swapped out standard glass for tempered glass. We used a composite deck material instead of a wood deck. We changed the bark mulch landscaping around the home to be landscape rock. Um, and we priced out all of those design changes um, for the home. And it was sort of a, a mid-level um, single family home that's typical of what you would find in Montana's wildland urban interface. And we found that the cost was negligible. There was actually really no difference between the cost of a wildfire resistant home and, and a typical standard home that you would find here. And, and we've done some additional analysis um, since then because we heard from communities that what's standard in Montana is not standard in other places. And um, you know, so we've looked at some other material choices for that kind of baseline home and have found still the cost to be pretty negligible. Um, at the most around a 10% change in cost. And that relates, I just wanna bring up this other wider scale work you've, you've collaborated on, uh, which I've written about a lot. Uh, living with, I think, planningforwildfire.org, I think is the link. And it's, uh, it's a community-based planning effort that I think gets at this point you just mentioned where there's no single cookie cutter solution here, right? So working in Montana or Oregon or or Tennessee, which also has big wildfire risks, and California, you're never going to have the same menu of options. But you have this planning process that seems really awesome to me. I wrote about it in ProPublica three years ago or so, but it seems also still hard to get it out and around. And as a communication-focused guy, I'm thinking, how, how can we all in this call and others, whether we're in the media or practitioners or scholars at universities, what can we do to create a landscape where the opportunities are more uh, accessible? Yeah, that's a, it's a question we, we um, wrestle with a lot. And, um, you know, one of the things I think about a lot is uh, why, why aren't we <laughs> building our communities to be better fire adapted? We, we know that fires are increasing. We know the risk is there. We um, also know, we have the science to know how to build our homes and our communities better to be safer. We have the data to show that homes built to these kinds of standards, communities that are built in these ways um, have a higher survival rate. It's not perfect, um, but they fare better. Um, we saw that in paradise. In fact, homes that were built after the California Building Code was enacted, um, they had a much higher survival rate than homes that were built before the Building Code. So what's, you know, what's stopping communities? What's that inertia? And um, you know, I think one of the challenges we face is is this sort of um, idea of, of of risk shift and and just like what are um, we do what other what we see other people doing and um, and changing that culture of um, expectation and culture of, of safety around living in these in environments that are fire adapted. Um, I think we need to create decision environments that 
make it easier um, for people. So that's where we land with thinking about uh, codes and regulations and ordinances that um, actually compel people um, to make better choices in how they're designing and building communities. Well, you, when you mentioned risk shift, um, the thing I was thinking about too is that there are a lot of communities that end up being basically free riders here where, and Headwaters Economics led me to some of this work on essentially federal fire suppression. If local communities aren't investing in some of that cost, they're basically a free rider. They, they get to build dangerously. Like I wrote about this in Colorado particularly, and someone else sort of bails them out or is going to hold their hand. And I, I don't know who on this call has well, Bettina, I know you as a journalist, you've dealt with these questions. That was a big chunk of your your 2008 series, right? The uh, sort of the fire industrial complex and or the pernicious incentives that are in the way of logic here. So, Bettina, could you weigh in on that? And, any, and anyone else who's presented at a town meeting? I imagine Tom, Tom and Jennifer, you've um, been involved in this sort of policy interface. Um, sure. So, um, sure. so I mean, in, in terms of, of ordinances and um, in, in, you know, California, you know, we have those ordinances, they, they, uh, and new development is subject to them, but there are millions, literally millions of homes that were built before those ordinances that um, do not have those protections, um, you know, that um, uh, have open ease. I mean, the people are always, you know, sort of astounded by those photographs of, you know, you see a completely ashen, development surrounded by trees that are unburned. But that's happened over and over right. and over again. Because what happens, you know, again, most of these really destructive fires, it certainly was true in paradise, they're wind driven. Embers are carried, you know, embers are like, you know, like little glowing, you know, cinders. Um, they can be carried by for a mile, a mile and a half, or even in the case of paradise, they were carried for like five miles. What they do is they get, um, in, they go in through an attic eave um, or attic vent. Um, they uh, get in under an open eave. Uh, they get in a crack in a you know. I mean, they can find. I mean, these these windstorms are just incredible. I mean, there are literally blizzards of embers that are raining down on on houses uh, and and vegetation. And so that is what you know. It's not a, an advancing flame front in most cases that sets these houses and these communities on fire. It's blowing embers that are blowing from like a mile and a half away, two miles away. They sit there, you know, the firefighters aren't there, the people have evacuated, they smolder, they start a house on fire, the house then starts the next house on fire. So it really is again and again and again. What you saw in paradise is not unusual. It's happened many, many, many times in Southern California. You have what becomes an urban conflagration and houses are fuel. I mean, I've seen various studies, you know, that show that like on a per, I don't know, per unit basis, there is far more fuel in the typical house than there actually is in an adjoining forest. So you, you know, you have to, you know, so these new ordinances are aimed at protecting homes from these embers. Uh, and they are not foolproof because like, you know, even houses that have been, in, you know, up the code, done everything they absolutely should, like a doggy door will be open or something like that. Or the people, you know, the garage door, they couldn't close it because the power was out and, the, you know, right. so the embers get in. So they're not foolproof on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have literally millions of homes in California and certainly all over the West that were built before these ordinances went into place and have open eaves, have, you know, vents. Um, and so there's, there's a, a lot of, there's some simple, very simple retrofitting that could be done. I mean, if you just replace a, a big entry point for these embers, um, that's you know um, uh, where a lot of houses catch on fire, is just through the attic um, vents. So if you just replace the attic vents with very you know they, these uh, replacement vents have been around for years now, where they um, they're more finely screened or they will close um, in response to, to heat and they will keep the embers out of the attic. You can do things like that at a very small cost um, and would make a big, big difference. Um, and then, you know, and so there's much more of this that needs to be done. In California, 
is not spending very much money on these home retrofits at all. If you just, you know, created a lot of grants where people in, you know, the, these high hazard zones could do some basic things, it would make a difference. Um, and another thing is that California just keeps on approving developments in high fire hazard yeah. zones. Um, and, uh, you know, they, the response is always, oh, well, you know, that's up to the local authorities, it's up to local authorities. And, you know, we all know that local authorities are, you know, get campaign contributions from developers. So, I mean, there's just a huge development that was approved a couple, I don't know, I guess it was last year by the Los Angeles County Supervisors called Tahone Ranch, which is going to be, you know, it's basically going to be an isolated, large community in a totally undeveloped area. So you're going to be bringing in more people in, you're going to be bringing in roads, you're going to be bringing in power lines, all the things that start ignitions. Right. Um, and palm trees <laughs> that in Southern and California. And, and palm trees, which are, are <laughs> planting local, stuff. Our tinky torches. Those are our tinky torches. Yeah. I've <laughs> showed video re repeatedly of what happens when a palm tree, uh, the, and they're all like Canary Island palms. There's, there's no such thing as an indigenous California palm tree. Actually, there are, I think there may be one or two one? native oh, palms. Good. But yes, most of what we see are not, are not native. Yeah. So a lot of the, what you're talking about, this gets to these super wicked issues, right? Like it's, we all would like to think there's just one thing to do. And here we've laid out a whole landscape, literally, of issues from historic suppression of fire through Tom's work and others, Jennifer's work on everything from invasive species, uh, like invasive grasses playing a big role in where fires get growing intensity. Climate change, of course, is there in the background as this just flipping the dice ever more toward ignition. And uh, I think still like the news landscape or the landscape of solutions that people end up experiencing doesn't match that list. Um, and as, you, as, you, as several of you said, Bettina just said very clearly, politics is aligned very badly to solve these kinds of problems. So we're, we'll focus now on like, where do we go from here? And I wanna actually bring in uh, a, a good friend who's mostly a remote friend, but we have met in person at the National Geographic Society. I'm pretty sure we did, Jim. Here's uh, Jim Bentley, who's a teacher. And you're in the Sacramento area? I hope I got this right. Whoops, where did he go? 10 minutes south of Sacramento in Elk Grove. So hi, Andy. Yeah. So Jim Bentley, you know, you're linked in right now live to a bunch of students. So could you describe your community and who's who's listening on Zoom? Um, I've got 28 fifth grade students that are just jumping in right now on YouTube and we're south of Sacramento. We're east of the fires in Napa right now. And it's been a um, pretty smoky few days. So I teach fifth grade all subjects and we've been working on math and now we're jumping over into fire science and climate change with you. That's so great. You know, we've had this whole challenge of everybody I know, including my wife who works in education in shifting to the online landscape. And it's created huge challenges, but there are pretty significant opportunities. Like right now, I wrote very early on, I wrote about Skype a scientist as a way for a teacher to bring a scientific expertise into a classroom. And now potentially you're all in a classroom right now. So, and they're gonna be asking some questions, I think in a couple of minutes via, and you'll be funneling them to us. So. I love that aspect of where we're going, um, even as this 2D way of relating to people has so many constraints. Uh, so uh, if you're, um, what are the conditions like in your part of California, Jim? So the, the last two nights have been the first two nights where we can sleep with the and maybe open. There's a bit of an echo, so if you can get your earbuds or something, gotcha. on, see if that can um, limit that. Sorry. And by the way, everyone else here, you're, uh, I want to be reminded, uh, Bettina, are you in Los Angeles or where are you? I am indeed in Los Angeles, yes. And that area is not a super hot spot, although you've had some fires in the region, for sure. Uh, no, there was a fairly big fire um, out in the San Bernardino National Forest. Um, uh, but uh, so far, you know, you know, I mean, you know, our worst fires always are in the Santa, fall Santa Ana season. So we're definitely not out of the woods yet, but, but so far most of the action has been in central and Northern California this year, but and we still have, we still have four months to go. 
Yeah, and Jennifer, I've written a lot about Colorado fires too and people building in red zones and stuff. So what's the general vibe there fire-wise right now? So we just uh, had a record breaker last night. So the Pine Gulch fire became Colorado's largest wildfire, um, clocking in at 139,000 acres, which surpassed the Heyman fire by a couple thousand acres. The good news is that it's a little bit moister and um, it's 77% contained. This is in the western part of the state, which also happens to be a climate hotspot that's seen an increase in temperature of two degrees Celsius mm -hmm. since 1895, which is double the global average increase in temperature. Um, now, what we're seeing where people are living is a lot of smoke. So the last couple of weeks, I feel like I've been choking on climate change. That part of this smoke is related to the increase in temperature. Not all of it and not all of the burning that we're seeing is is 100 percent related to climate change. But it's consistent with the trend, the increasing trend of burned area in the western U.S. So that's what we're dealing with. And. A lot of people here want to live in beautiful places that also are ha they are yeah. highly flammable, and so we've got, uh, you know, we've got many homes here that are in the line of fire, and the expectation is that there are more and more homes that are going to be put in the line of fire, and the question is not if it's going to burn, I, it's I get when to it's going to burn. Tom's situation and <laughs> and Kelly's too, but I'm going to show you a paper that was it's one of the most disturbing articulations of what you just described this was a this was 2014 and someone can quickly tell me if it's out of date but modeling residential development in california from tr through 2050 integrating wildfire risk wildland and agricultural encroachment and here's what they found um hold on one second we expect by 2050 that 640,000 45,000 homes will be built in areas currently designated as very high wildfire severity zones. That's currently designated. And those are not like going to be moderated. That's the actual basic ecological, physical risk zone. And the, the, the map is mind blowing. So anyone who thinks now, maybe has this gotten better since then? Or I know we, we've talked that California is changing some policies, but even if even if it's 20% less than that. This is a really a nightmare being built. It's what um, Stephen Strader and um, Walker Ashley, two geographers, call it the expanding bullseye. That There's a hashtag, expanding bullseye. So is this, what do we do? Like, or is this just going to play out? <laughs> Jennifer, you had kind of brought up that, that reality. So you must think about this all the time. And I'll get to Dustin. I want to circle back like, to Dustin, too, because of your lived experience in Santa Cruz County. Well, I think one of the big things with fire in particular, it's unlike other natural hazards and disasters in that like we do play a large role in starting wildfires and we can do a lot to change that. That's one thing. One less spark from people. The single day of the year with the most number of wildfires is July 4th. Yeah, We've seen 7,000 events over the last couple of decades that were all started because of our celebrations. I mean, the other thing, too, that's really important that this important work from Headwaters Economics is showing is there's a lot we can do to build better. We can right. change the constellations of homes. We can use road networks as fire breaks. We can change the materials that are being used. Sure, it's challenging to retrofit homes. Um, but there's a lot that we can do. I mean, I think that's the hopeful part. Um, but we have to have the policies and the shifts in human behavior um, in order to affect that change. And Tom, I, I wanted to get to you and then, and then Dustin on your what's what's the, the deal in the Southwest, which is, according to my colleagues at the Earth Institute, is heading into a mega drought. Sure, we've we've been been lucky. Can you hear me? Okay. You hear me? Yeah, yeah. I, I momentarily hit the wrong button. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. This year, uh, the the drought has been. I mean, the uh, the monsoon has been really kind of lousy. So we're we're in a droughty situation and it's getting worse. But New Mexico has kind of dodged the bullet so far. But we may be heading into a, a late fire season here now. My situation here is an interesting one. I, I'm living now in northern New Mexico, 
uh, at 7,200 feet in the middle of a ponderosa pine forest. I'm actually on a one-way in dirt road up a very steep mountainside. I'm in a proverbial wildland urban interface. And uh, when, I, when I moved here five years ago after I, I semi-retired, my friends said, you're nuts. What are you doing moving to a place like that? And I, I, part of it was it's, I wanted to live in a beautiful place. And I, it's a place where I, I grew up and I love this landscape. It's the Jemez Mountains near Los Alamos, New Mexico. And uh, so we bought a place that was already built. And it's actually a very firewise property. It had been thinned where the, most of the understory trees had been removed. And um, the risk on the property is, itself is relatively low. And the house itself is pretty firewise. But the surrounding area is just choked with fuels. And it's a one-way road in here. So the last five years, I've been working with the so-called firewise group here trying to get neighbors to become engaged and to deal with their properties. And I tell you, it's a, it's a huge boulder to push up a hill. If there's any place in, in the Southwest that's a poster child for high severity, large high severity fires, it's the Hamus Mountains where I'm living now. We've had probably five or six fires between 50,000 and 150,000 acres in the last 20 years. You might remember Los Alamos in New Mexico, which burned right. I believe in 2000, that was a that was a billion dollar fire because it burned about 500 homes and near the Los Alamos National Labs. So despite the fact that this is a poster child for high severity fire and the WUI, I, it, I sometimes I'm, I'm discouraged because it's so hard to get people to take action. Uh, I'd say within this neighborhood here with about 20 homes on a one home per every three or five acres, probably uh, five of us have done work on our property, despite the fact that there's wow. this history of, of severe wildfires. So one other point that, that actually is hopeful, it, I think it's a matter of turning turning our priorities around and refocusing energy and, and resources. Of those, those five or six high severity fires that have burned hundreds of thousands of acres here in the Hamas Mountains, we probably have spent upwards of $300 million dollars on suppressing those big wildfires, $300 million. And the amount of work, amount of money spent on thinning properties that's coming from state or federal resources is a tiny, tiny fraction of that. So, you know, this is that, that uh, analogy that I think Steve Pine brought up years ago. It's sort of like putting all of your resources into the emergency room and none into the preventative care. Right. Um, we're basically throwing money at stopping massive wildfires when if we put reasonable investment into communities into building firewise communities and landscapes we'd be much better off boy I, I assume that resonates with folks here um dustin you know you i want to get back to your lived experience there in santa cruz county in this context um you know a lot of people got comfortable living in the woods um, i've been at homes uh, north of you in marin county where people uh, are just literally tucked into regions you know it's like my friends who work in earthquake resistance resilience we're sitting in a in a building they know will collapse someday in portland oregon i was i had that experience so when you hear what you've heard here or just what you've learned in santa cruz county where you had such a con conflagration and such issues still what comes to mind and you just went blank for some reason as i was finishing that question let me see are you there dustin Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, the, the download's coming back a little slow, so bear with me. Just like shake your hands if you can't hear me or something like that, if okay. that makes sense. All oh, good. Looks like it failed. Nope, you're good. You're okay. Dustin, oh, he must be frozen on his end, I guess. Um, I hey, I'm here. Something. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? I'm going to maybe uh, open the door. Hold on. He's putting up the tin can, you know, <laughs> antenna. He's getting out the tin can antenna. While, while he's doing that, I want to show you something. I have this vision that we can maybe all together. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. The we can hear you clearly. 
I can hear you well. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm so sorry about that. What was your question again? Um, with this inertia factor, do you, when you think where you are right now in your county, when you think about how a lot of the community yeah. that you, you deal with is focused on climate change, Right. But the, clim the climate solution here, meaning cutting CO2, doesn't change the risk landscape on the ground for decades, right? right? So what, what can drive no, that, that, rational right. policy going forward? So I should, if I could step back just a little bit, when I first moved here, I met people who were super concerned about this issue. And now I realize why, because there was a 1904 slash 1905 fire that burned, the map suggests smaller. I think it burned way more. There's actually three fires at the same time. And my read of it in the creeks that they're describing, it's way bigger than the, this current fire. Um, and But the difference is it was stump town slash the big fires were the mills. It was like Burning Man. You had giant mills with giant piles of wood and then <laughs> timberland, in fact, on, um, that document that I shared with you, if you scroll down, you'll see like some yellowish images. And that's for folks who are in that area, that's um, behind the new leaf. And that's the slope going up Ben Lomond Mountain. You could see just kind of random trees. That's a huge forested area today. So you could see why people were freaked out when a fire with no fuel covered everything. And then suddenly you had a forest there. Um, the, the fireball, I think, was, was the major issue there. Um, on your the topic of so what happened was groups the, the resource conservation districts and lots of people got together they raised money because there's no money at the state so they got grants they built fire breaks those fire breaks saved a lot of houses mm. they saved a lot of communities I actually think Santa Cruz just needs to harden the houses I think the fires here like if you look at that the lines they they it's amazing you can read the 1904 fire they're holding the line to save Wilder's dairy. And then it's the same freaking line. This time it dies up at the top of Smith grade. It's kind of the same drainage. I went back to the NOAA technical forecast. That's where the fog was Very interesting. that night, the marine layer. So the fog came up and over Ben Lomond Mountain, hit the ocean, cooled off. And that's, I think, that's why I keep saying fog is your firefighter here. That's basically saved the community of Santa Cruz and it's kind of a buffer. That fire line, I mountain bike that thing a thousand times. I, I asked my wife to marry me on that freaking fire line, which is insane in this whole thing. That's crazy. Wilder Ridge is part of this whole fire line. Like, what is going on? Anyhow, so um, those fire fuel breaks, the Warinella fire break, a year ago, I took, we went up to the Big Ben tree. It's a gigantic old growth tree on the top of Ben Lomond. It's really weird that there's a giant tree at the top of Ben Lomond Mountain. Um, my wife was pregnant. We took all these cool pictures and I pointed out to my parents-in-laws. I was like, oh, look, they just made a huge fire break along Empire Grade here. It was literally a year ago. And they held that line and kept it from getting into the valley below. So they don't have the money. They, they um, The state spent money this year in the Santa Cruz Mountains. They spent it on Highway 17. That's a good move. They didn't spend any money by the, the, the fire, unfortunately. You got to make decisions. That was a disaster waiting to happen. You have traffic coming over from San Jose into Santa Cruz Mountains in this forested area that's not burned in forever. So they cleared that out really nicely. So I think the, because that's a hard conversation, right. the fuel break part, just that alone. I remember it. I remember going to meetings with Gray Hayes, is a, a, the local person who knows so much about fire in this area. And, you know, people were pissed. They don't want fire breaks. I'm sure people were pissed about that fire break on Empire Grade right. that I was glowing about. Um, and now I bet you they, and, and, and then people get confused about breaks versus like, but it didn't save my house. Right, and it's like, right, well, your right, house right. just needed one ember and a torch. So you can't really help that. So, and then um, the other thing, and this is amazing. And it's just a side note. That fire is that the 1904, 1905 fire burned for 14 months because a tree, a redwood tree exploded essentially in May after after the rainy season. I mean, that's an amazing thing. This, this tree holds its own, it's so confident it holds its own fire and re-releases it later on, which is totally crazy. They 
are monitoring that situation in the Santa Cruz mountains. That's wild. There are people that are like, there might be redwoods burning all winter smoldering. So we got to be ready for, to make sure um, that, that gets addressed. The one other thing I'll add here that I've heard rumors about, which is that one of the things that caused this conflagration was a bunch of undetected strikes in high fuel. So there was stuff smoldering that they didn't know was smoldering. And then suddenly you had the, the conditions of that, of the maybe the marine layer sinking, or, or I don't know, that, that's for the fire weather people. But uh, some, something fierce happened back there. And, and there's a big, big old burn scar somewhere um, on, on that. I, I dropped a, a document I'll share on, on Twitter later. Um, it's showing you basically the view what, of what I think is going to be where the crown fire is up there. I know this Very place too well, but I also, I should add, I learned a lot from my wife. My wife did her PhD on cheatgrass invasions from climate and cheatgrass is, as you know, is the big fire thing. So I'm trying to realize, trying to figure out how I became a fire expert without being a fire <laughs> expert. And it's just because I'm always in environmental studies. Like that's the people I'm around. They, and, and people in environmental studies, we have three redwood ecologists on the faculty. When we had a, the meeting, he was evacuating. The, the fact that he was not concerned at all about the redwoods, I was like, I'm, I'm not worried. I was seeing people sending pictures. I mean, how many Doug fir or tiny 80-year-old redwood twigs did you see on fire that people were saying were old growth? I mean, that's the lesson. Journalism, journalism needs to take some tree classes. Come to environmental studies. Audit our classes. Well, Bettina's been on that beat and in those no, classes no, no. essentially for three decades, but she's an outlier. I, you know, I, wish, I think one of the things I'm trying to work on at the uh, initiative that we're running here is to, um, in, in a time of declining journalism resources, especially at the local and regional level, what can we do to facilitate access to data, whether it's lightning strike uh, or housing quality or in the other things we're working on, flood risk, um, and um, whether you're in Bangladesh or in Big Sur. So this is, a, a, to me, a prime reason I'm doing what I'm doing and not just writing stories these days. We have to do it all. Like, it's an and, and, and thing. Now, I want to circle this to, quickly to Jim Bentley because a lot of what you were just describing, Dustin, is, makes this a great teachable moment, that whether you're undergraduate or graduate students at UCSC, or at any SJSU or any school in these regions. Um, and Jim, at your level in classrooms, whether it's middle or upper school, it feels like there's an opportunity here to intersect data with learning, with expertise. We did some examples. You must know Dan Hammer, I think, from Geographic. Yes. Maybe not. Yeah. He, he well, has, earth, we're, we're he has a thing called Earthrise. On. Sorry, go for it. Oh, no, I was just going to say, we, we actually are going to be working on a project with his Earthrise Alliance, uh, doing some satellite uh, analysis with uh, Vernal Pools is what I believe the topic's going to be. And Dan Hammer's an amazing individual, yes. Well, I've just posted a link. He runs this thing now called Earthrise.education, too, which is, I, I did two webcasts here related to this, where their teachers in Massachusetts and Iowa were sifting satellite imagery, showing... Uh, gold mining incursions into Amazon Indian tribal territory. And the work that the students did actually enabled Reuters to write a story about the gold mining surging into the, this particular Yanomami reserve. So everything we're talking about here feels like it's just as integratable as that. If we got a curriculum or student portal so that students can get those maps I showed, that map of California's red zones, and then they, they can start to say to their own community, hey, what the hell? What's with our zoning? Why, why are we not building with these tools that, that Kelly laid out? So it, I, this is, I'd like to close out. We have some time here for students to direct questions through you, Jim, yeah. to whoever can stay on a little longer because it's 2 o'clock now. But, but I would love to see if we can come away from here in a few minutes with just the idea that there's something to work on. I appreciate that. Would you like me to share some of the student questions now? My, my Zoom chat, I've got my students chatting yeah, on one side. totally. And I've got you going. And I can tell That's each great. of the panelists that my students are absolutely thrilled with what you're saying. Uh, we've been talking about fire and climate and really experiencing it firsthand in Northern California uh, with the smoke that's been pouring in and 
dropping everywhere. Um, one of the students uh, was curious to know, uh, and I, I think uh, uh, Dave, you might have, or Dustin, you might have spoken to this. Uh, what, what's like one of the longest burning ever fires in recorded history that we're aware of? 14 months seems like a long time. Do they go longer than that? I, I'm going to just get off of this real quick, but I'll tell you there there are coal there are coal mines burning. Um, I'm working on a book for many years about the Kaparowitz Plateau, which is the largest coal deposit never developed in the Southwest. And that um, there is something called the Burning Hills, and that's got coal way under the ground, burning, smoking. So that stuff can burn forever. But I'll let others answer on the forest because I don't know that. I mean, I, I think Tom can can speak to. I mean, you you get fires in. Um, the, I mean, if you, if you hike through the giant sequoia groves or you hike through the redwood groves, particularly the giant sequoias, you see these huge hollowed out uh, parts of the base of a giant sequoia that is still very, very much alive. And you basically had fires, you know, hollowing out that, that uh, area for months and months. So, you know, particularly with lightning fires, you will have, um, and, and where they hit, you can have uh, at the higher elevations where it's cooler, uh, and wetter, you can have small little spot fire, lightning fire, smoldering for weeks and months, and they don't go out until it snows or, or you get a heavy rain. I mean, that's not really unusual. Uh, and that is a way, um, actually, that, that you know, nature did, did some housekeeping. You had a small little fire that was just smoldering and creeping along, wasn't doing much damage. It was burning out the undergrowth. It was burning out the young trees and um, and helping to keep things open. I would just like to say one thing, um, if it, well, do I have, no, I won't actually. Let's let's keep on answering the questions. Sure. I was just going to say, uh, yeah, with regard to long, long lasting fires, I think Bettina is exactly right. Fires can, as soon as they can start in the spring, they would burn prior to putting them out in the fire suppression era. Fires would burn into the late fall and the winter time. It's very rare, exceedingly rare in the lower 48 states to see carryover fires that would go over from one year to the next. But that is actually starting to be observed now in Canada and other places in high latitudes where fires are burning in peat layers in right. what was formerly frozen permafrost. Now uh, you have layers that are actually can burn over from one year to the next so this is a, a it's a rare thing to see a you know a back-to-back -back year burning of fires but it may be something we'll see in the future especially in the far northern latitudes where there's lots of fuel that can smolder uh in the ground layers and andy can i say one one thing to the students who are participating one yeah. thing, so I'm a college professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And one thing I will say is if you can grab onto some coding skills, learn how to code, because the next great exchanges of ideas are gonna be in code. And we have to empower students to be able to manipulate all this amazing data that we've collected about our planet. And so that's the one thing I would say is like, you know, as a fire scientist, the one thing that I'm good at is I'm good at pulling together lots of different data from different sources and being clever about how I put it together and the puzzle that puzzle pieces that I put together to try and understand how our planet is changing. And you all can do that. Just need to pick up some coding skills. Yeah, can I pick up on that? Just to add one, one yeah. point. I think that that's essential. I mean, that's been one of my things that we're, trying to get into our environmental studies program because we're seeing that the information's out there. I think the, the dynamics are changing. On the other hand, we really need more people to understand natural history or, or not just going out there and understanding these landscapes. I mean, I think that is why I can see what's happened in this fire. Like, I know every burn stump in this place. People forgot the last pandemic. People forget the last big fire. And we, we need people to kind of know that stuff a little better, I think. Amazing. Um, uh, Jim, what else is on your list there? This is great. I, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to share this. And we'd actually echoed the need to code as we were looking at a uh, NASA video earlier, looking at wildfires, looking at the campfire from 2018. Um, one of the other questions that a student had asked was, um, how bad are the fumes that we're, we're seeing, the smoke that we're seeing, the particulates that we're seeing coming off of these wildfires going through forested areas, but also uh, urban inhabited areas. How how much concern should there be about that? 
I can answer that since I'm getting all your smoke from California. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's a great app, first of all, that has been provided by the EPA called Smoke Sense. I would definitely recommend checking that out for your students. You can download it to your phone and essentially it gives you an indication of two things that are really bad for your lungs. One is the particulate matter in the atmosphere, so the small, tiny particles that are essentially aggravating your lungs. And the other thing is ozone. And so those two things have been quite bad for the past couple of weeks. Um, and also, um, I'll tell you a little bit about why why they're bad and when they get really bad. So, but the particulate matter, especially if you've got overnight fires that are smoldering, they produce a lot of toxic stuff that just kind of hangs out and sits there in the early morning hours. And then as it gets hot in the afternoon, you get more production of ozone, which is also really bad for your lungs too. So those two things are things that um, epidemiologists, health scientists take a look at when they're thinking about, oh wow, how bad is the smoke? The other thing that's important to know is there is so much stuff that comes off of combustion. So about 600 different types of chemicals have been documented that come off of um, combustion. And it's even more complicated when, when you're talking about homes burning and all of the plastics, all of the materials that go into our homes are now going up in smoke. So it, it can be quite toxic um, what this, what's in that smoke. Pretty, pretty if, challenging. If I can add, add one more thing to that, um, the way it's set up in Santa Cruz, uh, that smoke, once they got it under control, all piled into the marine layer. So it's like a classic inversion. You just basically see dark smoke. If I walked out, I was like, oh, look, it's foggy again, because we had all this fog that basically helped put the fire. I mean, the fog layer went way up. They had rain. The Cal Fire didn't tell anybody about the rain. And that's one thing I realized about this natural disaster, having pretty, having more information than anybody around me, basically, about the fire, just because I know everybody here. Um, half of this game is idiot management and keeping people out of the fire, not doing stupid stuff. Um, like they don't want to tell everybody it rained and cooled off a lot of parts up there. I mean, it literally, I've got video from friends who had cameras everywhere. They're sending it to me, look, it's raining. I'm like, there's your old place, man. It's raining at your old studio. Don't worry about it burning down right now. I was like, oh, third week of August, that's a freak show. I don't remember if rain, I mean, there's, I, it's another thing I keep track of. I'm, I got too many spreadsheets of stuff. I, I <laughs> see too much, too much of a counter. Well, I, I'm getting the strong sense that we'll Can need I to follow. Sorry, we'll need to follow up to build. A, I do want to build toward a solution matrix here. I think there's some things we can work on. Kelly, you wanted to say something? Oh, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to add, you know, one of the things about wildfire smoke. Oh, yeah, I can hear. Can yep. you hear me? OK, yep. one, one of the things about wildfire smoke, like like many things related to wildfire and, and other natural disasters, is that it affects the most vulnerable among us disproportionately. So the elderly, the very young, people with disabilities, and um, those are also the people most impacted, of course, by the pandemic right now. So we've right. got this compound risk that's that's pretty profound, and, and we don't yet know, I think, what that picture will look like. Um, and I wanted to share a resource that your students might be interested in, Jim. Um, this is a tool we just built with the Forest Service called Wildfire Risk to Communities. It's at wildfirerisk.org. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time that um, wildfire risk at the community level has been mapped nationwide, wall to wall for the whole country. And it includes information about vulnerable populations. So you can wow. see um, what uh, vulnerable populations um, are in your community. And it also includes resources for reducing risk. So there's a whole section on community health, um, a whole section on fuel treatments, uh, sections on home hardening and land use regulations, lots of great tools and resources. I'd just like to say something in, in terms of the air quality. And yes, I mean, wildfires do produce a lot of, um, you know, very bad uh, air quality. But the, uh, that also figures into um, um, limiting the window of controlled burns, which is something that in some, you know, some uh, areas, not all, um, some landscapes we want more of. Uh, and that has happened over and over again in, uh, in California, um, where the National Park Service especially, you know, has, you know, has um, been doing and, um, you know, wants to do controlled burns in um, some of the parks and like, uh, you know, with among the sequoias, et cetera. And frequently they can't do it because um, one of the um, 
places in California that has some of the worst air quality is the San Joaquin Valley, which is um, uh, just below uh, the Sierra Nevada. Uh, and so, um, you know, doing controlled burns is a very complicated thing. I mean, you not only have to look at fire conditions and make sure that you're not starting a bigger fire accidentally, which has certainly happened, um, but also you have to get permits from the air quality uh, control, you know, regulators. So it's, um, again, all, all of this is so complicated. There is no easy solution. Uh, there is no one solution. And there are things pushing back against every single thing that we want to do, including, you know, the very legitimate concerns about air quality that are limiting a lot of control burns, which would help and, and you know, are what the landscape needs, certain parts of the landscape, not all. Yeah, one of the communication challenges there maybe is... How do we foster the understanding that, that those forests will burn, there will be that pollution with or without? Right. Well, and then, of course, it'll be even more. You know, if, the, right, exactly. if you get a raging big wildfire, you'll have far more air pollution than with a controlled burn, a properly yeah, protected controlled burn. I'll just touch on one example. In, in two, just as the last year of Dot Earth, I did this piece when I was out in um, one of the national parks, and they, it took them 13 years to negotiate getting this burn in, in this particular grove. It was kind of mind blowing to see that length of time for one tiny, I think it was like 700 or 800 acres. Uh, so that feels like a real crucial element to try to overcome. I did see recently some coverage, I, I'm sure you've done this too, of um, indigenous uh, groups getting more in, in, empowered or getting into the conversation on landscape management using fire. But it feels like a very tough hurdle in California. It is. So. It's a very tough road. All of this stuff is a very tough road. Yeah. Every every single bit of it. So uh, smoke is Jim, a. Sorry. I was going to say smoke is a problem. It, it's a bottleneck and in, uh, everywhere. Just quick example here in my neighborhood, my wildland urban interface. We've just done a big thinning project around the neighborhood. The Forest Service actually paid for it and did the work, and there are piles ready to be burned, but we're having lots of pushback from the neighbors about burning the piles. They're worried about smoke. They're worried about smoke damage in their house. Um, one of the, one of the uh, mitigation tactics that um, people are, are taking now with, with smoke is, well, keep your doors closed, keep your windows closed, and air filters. Uh, you know, they're, they're really good quality air filters, and there's studies to show that these air filters in the house, these are little small, uh, to large portable air filters, they have the filters, and they actually clean the air in your house, and they're actually pretty effective. This is actually living with fire, is uh, dealing with the smoke and keeping your windows closed when we have to burn up these fuels to reduce our yeah. risk. Yeah, Dustin just put a comment, and now everybody knows what an N95 mask is uh, because of COVID-19, but here we have this risk too. And I, I wrote a lot about um, indoor cooking, biomass cooking in developing countries, and the the levels of smoke are astounding. So there, these issues are really profound. They're very enduring. I'm hoping that they can be engaging for students, particularly Jim, and not paralytic. I think maybe we could learn from the students if they, at school to school, get engaged in ways to bring this to life. My wife works uh, for a group that helps teachers use PM 2.5 meters in urban settings to understand particulate pollution levels like in the Bronx versus Brooklyn. And that same, at least that, that situational awareness doesn't solve the problem, but it would be a way for students to get engaged with them. Um, I, I can answer that question. Well, I wanna, I'd like to hear from Jim a little bit more if we can. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, that's all a question some, from Jim. Yeah, some student, anything else from your students before we start to close down here? Yeah, uh, and I really appreciate you validating the, the power of, of what it means to ask questions. And, and we had this discussion this morning that really Sometimes having really good questions is a lot better than having some answers, you know, or answers that we believe to be true. Right. Um, one of the other questions that, that uh, students had was when we're looking at fires, wildfires in particular, um, what are some specific ways that, that, that climate change seems to be fueling those? Because we know, you know, mm -hmm. climate is a weather average. It's not a causal thing. It's more a, a result of what happens because of causations. But um, if, if, a, if a student's parent said, you know, how is this climate change making this fire worse? You know, what would you say? Well, we did lose, Jennifer Balch had to go to another meeting. So she had talked about some of that early on. 
I, I don't know, uh, Tom or Dustin or, or Bettina. I, I can share a link that. with a, a thesis from uh, San Jose State from two or three years ago that someone was sharing recently that explains the phenomena that happened in the Santa Cruz Mountains with the upper desiccation of the atmosphere as the fire picked up. So yeah. there's what, I mean, what, what warming temperatures does, it's, it's extending the fire season. Um, so it's making the window where fires, you know, uh, yes. can burn longer. Um, and it is like, in, for instance, in the Sierra Nevada, I mean, one thing that is absolutely indisputable about warming temperatures is it's decreasing the snowpack which means that the snow uh, is melting earlier in the spring, which means that there's a longer period of time for the soil and vegetation to, um, to dry out. Now- and my wife's dissertation found that cheat grass is creeping up that snow level. Right, but cheat grass is not really related to climate change. Uh, I don't know, look at the devil's post pile. Uh, yeah, but what's happening with cheat grass, it's a, I mean, it's an invasive, that was introduced accidentally probably more than 100 years ago um, and was spread by cattle and grazing. It is most prolific in the Great Basin in northern Nevada where it is just basic and, and it accelerates the fire cycle uh, because it burns every year. It's, a, you know, it's an annual that dies. But um, so you've, you're extending the fire season Hotter temperatures means that you know vegetation will dry out more quickly. Therefore, it is more most susceptible. One thing um, that I think does have to be pointed out, though, it doesn't have the same effects everywhere in the state. Um, and I mean, there is you know there's somewhat of a bit of a dispute between some scientists in California about this. But I think the place where climate change is, is going to have the greatest effect is in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, and in the mountains areas, which, you know, are going to be not as cool and not as moist uh, as they were. It's probably going to have less an effect, and some scientists argue really very little effect in places like Southern California, which during the summer, it doesn't rain, it's always hot. I mean, there, in, in other words, there's always, you know, uh, a baseline uh, where a fire can easily start in Southern California because it is, you know, it's a Mediterranean climate. It's semi-arid, it's hot and dry. So the effects of climate change are really going to vary according to you know where you are in the state and the landscape. And another thing, if I may just quickly you know, say, is that there are many different for fire regimes in the West. The fire regime is, you know, what is the the um, the vegetation sort of naturally without any human interference before you know settlement or whatever how often would it naturally burn? And that very much depends on where you are and the type of vegetation. Um, and a problem is that um, there's been this sort of simplistic applying of the fire regime of a mid-elevation Sierra Nevada to the entire state. Um, mm -hmm. And Tom, you know, I'm sure could speak a much more um, uh, uh, extensively on that, but this is just one part of the state that was adapted, you know, is, you know, the vegetation was adapted to frequent low intensity fires that were caused, you know, started by uh, lightning, you know, and, you know, and Native Americans. Um, but that's not true of the entire state. And what, you know, what Cal Fire and government and, you know, sort of the popular conception is, oh, we need to bring this back to, you know, to the entire state. Well, no. If you burn the chaparral and the coastal sagebrush, which covers the mountains of Southern California and the hills of Southern California, if you burn that like every five or 10 years, you will have no chaparral or coastal sagebrush left. You will have just a bunch of invasive grasses that will burn every year. And that is actually what is happening in, um, I mean, if you drive around LA, um, you know, you'll see hillsides that are just, you know, they're just, um, you know, dried up uh, invasive grasses. Uh, and that is changing the natural fire regime in, in Southern California because we have so many humid ignitions. And so the chaparral and the coastal sagebrush, um, which Cal Fire always likes to dismiss as brush, um, mm -hmm. uh, is burning so often that it cannot recover. And then you have this really god awful fire cycle of invasive grasses that will burn every year and that start and ignite very, very easily. 
and I mean, and cheatgrass. Cheatgrass isn't so much in Southern California because it's it's too. Um, we have different. You know, we have something called red brome. Um, uh, uh, so cheatgrass is more in, in a colder climate, but you've got right. all these invasives that so are a huge problem. Here. So we're we're we're, we're going to start to pull toward conclusion here, Jim. Was this was there one or more two questions that came in? And I think you know it's pretty clear this is part one of yeah. something. I wanted to get on an indigenous fire expert uh, as well. We'll do some more sessions on this. Unfortunately, as someone said, this is still early in the fire season. Um, so Jim, a, quick, a couple of quick questions from your students, and I want to show something to conclude. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've got one student who's curious to know when it comes to fires spreading, how fast literally can a fire move? We, we've seen explosive fires, you know, miles per hour, acres per hour. What kind of speed, what kind of rate are we looking at fires spreading? They can spread far faster than you can run. Uh, there's a famous story of the Man Gulch fire when uh, 11 or so smoke jumpers were unable to outrun a fire running up a hillside. They were in grassy fuels in the middle of a forest. But it's incredible. With uh, the other, the other factor is wind, of course. So fire will spread as fast as the wind is blowing. As Bettina talked about earlier, and others, that there's kind of a storm, a windstorm of embers, millions and millions of embers flying in front of a fire front, uh, miles in front of a fire front. So fires can actually hop from one burning area to another and cover huge amounts of landscape. Here in the Hamas, we had this fire called um, the, the uh, Los Conchas fire. It burned in 2011. And in the first eight hours, it burned 40,000 acres. 40,000 wow. acres in eight hours. Wow. This is, uh, someone calculated something like two football fields per second of area burning yeah. over eight that's hours. A, that's a strong visual. To, to piggyback on that, unless someone else wanted to jump in, um, another question was, um, when you're looking at a fire that's like this and you're trying to put it out and we're dealing with drought-stricken areas already, how many gallons of water or, or what kind of equivalent are we talking about to put out some of these fires? How much water is actually used? And are there other resources besides fire? We know, we know backfires can work, but really focusing in on the water, students are wondering how much water is being used. In the in the typical wildfire, I mean, they use um, really it's uh, you know there will be helicopter drops of water and um, air tanker drops of retardant, but really most of the firefighting is on the ground. Um, and what they do is they uh, build fire lines. Um, you know, they bulldoze areas. Uh, you know, clean free of vegetation. I mean, you know, you, you always see a fire is like X percent contained, X percent contained. That doesn't mean that it's X percent out. It means that they have built, you know, they have surrounded the fire, you know, X percent of the fire with fire lines. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when it turns to actual water, I mean, that's actually not the major way that they fight wildfire. Um, and it will be used to, you know, protect residences, and there will be helicopter drops of water. But I mean, you know, these fires are huge. Um, and as Tom said, I mean, they can just, uh, you know, they can, depending on the wind and depending on what's burning, they can just travel at an incredible pace. So water is actually not the main way that wildfires are, are put out. So thank Sorry. you. I, I, I would, yeah, I would just add that we're really, really good at putting out fires. In, in this country, we get about 95% of fires on initial attack, meaning within those first few hours. And it's only a small percentage that become these, these huge disasters that we read about in the newspaper, that we see in the news that are putting up this much smoke. Um, and, and you can imagine that as we have more fire on the landscape because of climate change, our firefighting resources are gonna get stretched even farther. And we might not be able to catch as many as quickly as we do now. There you go. So I want to sh close by showing a couple of resources that we talked about that I think are really good for to think about whether it's community awareness and change or student awareness and, and engagement. They feel pretty cool. Um, so hold on a second while I share the screen. Whoops, right here. One was clearly uh, the new, um, here it is, wildfirerisk.org. I'm going to dive in there and see what we can learn. I did mention planning for wildfire, which is that planningforwildfire.org, which is that uh, more community planning 
consultancy capacity that's out there. There's earthrise.education, which I mentioned. And Jim, we should brainstorm with Dan right now, I believe, on a, a, a beta test of a wildfire rebuilding uh, curriculum. That's exciting. So students, as you can see here, it's earthrise.education. This is to get students uh, engaged with data in ways that can be actionable and you know, produce actionable results on the ground, whether it's a story for Reuters on Amazon gold mining, or in this case, it could be a story on your own resilience of your community going forward. Cool. And I think I'm still trying to figure out, I would like to design a um, kind of a decision theater, as Arizona State calls it, where we can engage people in any community uh, through their zoning board and other organizations in, a, in sort of a scenario-based exercise to j drive uh, better decisions or perhaps more reality-based decisions. Bettina, uh, my colleague Dale Willman, is doing re uh, journalist trainings to get journalists to think about these systemic aspects of these problems. You do this. I, I've done this, but we're still sort of a, a majority minority. And the, again, news capacity is shrinking. So how do we right. fill, fill that yeah, gap? Yeah, that's, that's a problem. There are fewer and fewer journalists and they have to do you know more and more. So that does not um, really suggest time to do more, you know, more thoughtful. No. Um, but that's where I think. But that's where I think an a place like the Earth Institute or other academic centers can do some something to create, like Climate Central has done, to create tools or a way to do a local map using data sets that are out there. I think there's ways that then could translate into a newsroom capacity. We'll find out. It's a new adventure here too. So I want to show you one quick clip, and then and thank you, Jim. Thanks so much for you to you and your students. How many students? Twenty-eight students, fifth graders. Oh my gosh. So if they, if, you. if they, uh, you know, if they write something up, let me know what, what they do. And we can get them on here sometime. That'd be really fun. We'd love to. Uh, Thank you, Andy. Um, because there's lots of work to do here. And I just want to show an awesome clip that I think is worth people thinking about as part of a scenario. This is a National Institute for Science for, uh, it's NIST, the uh, Standards and Technology. They set a prescribed fire in New Jersey a year or so ago, and they created a 360 video. So this is a fire that, that was supposed to burn. I don't know if you can hear. Can you hear the sound, folks? Yep. So, and this 360 allows you, allows me to almost fully experience what it's like. to be in a forest that's overdue to burn. The camera is immersed in a bowl of water. This is real time right now. This is not, not speeded up. And this was a controlled burn? Yeah, in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. So, it feels to me like there's a way to build an experience, whether it's virtual or in a big auditorium, where you could look at the map of your community. You could see the vulnerabilities that wildfirerisk.org has laid out. You know, what's the fuel load? When was the last time it burned? We, we know those data. What are the climatological norms? And you could uh, say, what's our zoning? What are our building codes? What can we do to do a little less bad? <laughs> Uh, it feels like a great learning experience. And by the way, this is what a forest that's overdue to burn looks like. Do we really want that um, in our part of wherever we're living? So I, I'm, I think that that experiential mapped decision oriented experience might be something to work on too. And it's not something I could work on readily when I was a New York Times reporter. And I feel these kinds of engagements we're doing here now, including with students, I think are really invaluable. So I got to call this to an end because we're way over time. It's 2.30. It's uh, here on the East Coast. It's great to be back. Great to be back in gear. I was off for two weeks and more because my computer blew up. And these sessions go on every week. Um, Sunday is one of our regular um, music-oriented sessions. Uh, Sunday mornings from 10.30 to 12 Eastern time. And we'll be back into gear on other sessions going forward next week and onward. Thank you for visiting with uh, Sustain What. This is a uh, an effort of the 
Earth Institute at Columbia University's new initiative on communication and sustainability, which is now one year old and I'm trying to fill the gaps in our communication ecosystem. We started this webcast uh, March 15th in the early days of the COVID-19 lockdown, but now we're expanding into all the other issues that are confronting communities worldwide that are urgent and that where one of the solutions is to communicate more effectively. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, Jim Bentley, a great science teacher, teacher in uh, a place-based learning expert PBL, search for PBL. Bettina Boxall, Pulitzer Wise Prize winning reporter who's been on this environment beat with me for three decades. And uh, Kelly Pohl at Headwaters Economics, which is he at HeadEcon on Twitter. And Tom Swetnam, University of Arizona. And uh, Dustin Mulvaney from San Jose State University who has been <laughs> in the middle of the worst of this uh, in uh, Santa Cruz County. And of course, Jennifer Balch from University of Colorado who had to leave a little early. Thank you all for being part of this experiment called Sustain What? Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you. Let's, stay, let's get back in touch. Let's stay in touch and iterate.